Content warning, this episode discusses murder and violence. Two cases we've been covering a lot of recently are, of course, the Delphi murders in Indiana and the University of Idaho murders in Idaho. These cases are actually quite different in some ways, although they both share one thing. They've attracted intense media scrutiny. And partly as a result of that intense media scrutiny, they also both have gag orders associated with them. Now, in our experience, there's a lot of confusion, understandably so, about what exactly gag orders mean and what they actually do and what the purpose is. And so today in this episode, I thought we might just basically focus on the topic of gag orders in general, but especially as they pertain to these two cases in Indiana and Idaho, and maybe look at some of the similarities, some of the differences, and also how different entities have reacted to these gag orders. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Delphi Murders and the University of Idaho Murders, Gag Orders. What is a gag order? What, what what exactly does this mean? Well, basically, it is when the court issues a ruling restricting the ability of certain people to talk about certain facts of the case in some way. It's usually like perhaps the, the people who are attorneys on the case, people who are parties to the case, people who may be potential witnesses – for whatever reasons, the court may decide that it is proper to limit the ability of those people to go out and just say whatever they want. Now, I mean, why why do courts do this? Is it because they're covering something nefarious up? Is it because they just hate free speech? The main reason these gag orders happen is because the court is concerned about pretrial publicity. And they're concerned about it generally in how it affects the defendant. Because one of the most important roles a judge has when they hear a case is they need to do their best to guarantee that the person who is charged with the crime actually receives a fair trial. And if people are going out willy-nilly, and saying irresponsible or untrue things about a person on trial, that sort of publicity can affect how potential jurors see that person. So, for instance, uh, let's say the prosecutor in a case. And this is just all hypothetical. I'm not talking about the prosecutor in Delphi or in Idaho. Let's say the prosecutor in a case says, oh, the person charged with this crime is John Smith, he's a bad person. He abuses uh, kids and animals. And that's not what he's charged with, but doesn't it just show he's a bad person, folks? You don't want people to be able to say things like that. You want to put limits on what they say or do. And that would be the rationale behind a gag order. And, And isn't it not just about maybe putting out falsehoods, but it's even if you're saying John Smith was accused of brutally murdering his wife, and here's exactly how he did it, and here's all the facts of the case, there's still a prejudicial effect of that, right? So it's not just about like not putting out misinformation. It's like we need to be responsible about how we put out, you know, real information. Yes, real true information could also be prejudicial. Let's say John Smith is charged with brutally murdering his wife, and it is true that he also abuses kids or pets. That all very well may be true, but the judge in the case might feel that if this information about John Smith's earlier acts gets out, 
people might say, well, if he abuses kids, he might he must also be a wife killer. And the judge may feel that is so separate from what's being charged that it, it really just harms John Smith's rights more than it adds light to helping us all understand what happened. Now, let's take one of the cases that we're actually going to be talking about, though, because I want to really underline what what this means for these real cases. And we'll go in a moment more into detail with Idaho and Delphi and also some of the pros of a gag order and also some of the cons of a gag order. But, you know, it's not a situation where it would be OK then for the prosecutor or detectives to go out and give a bunch of media interviews about what specifically, say, Brian Koberger is accused of doing in the Idaho case. Like, that would not be okay. Basically, if the the prosecutor or whoever wants to talk about what Koberger is charged with, they have the charging documents. They have the, the PCA, and all of that information is spelled out in those. So you can just, the prosecutor or whoever can just refer people to those documents where it's been filed with the court. Because it's important to remember that these gag orders only apply to extrajudicial comments. We'll get more into that in a moment. But basically what you're saying is it's almost to kind of really boil it down and put it in language for me to understand. It's basically saying, save it for the court. Everybody save it for the court. Like, do the talking in the court. Like, this is all going to be happening within the courtroom uh, filings, uh, you know, different back and forth, cross examinations. That's where everything should be playing out, not in extrajudicial comments to the media. Yeah, it, it, I think it's important for everyone to remember there are very specific rules as to what can or cannot be said or used in a trial. There, there are rules about what can and can't be put into filings and things like that. There's almost no rules as to what you can tell a reporter. When you limit a person's ability to not make extrajudicial comments, you're basically saying this person just has to do their talking in court. Absolutely. We're first going to go over the Idaho gag order. And this gag order is particularly interesting because it actually pits some unexpected groups against one another and, and sort of actually has some sort of strange alliances forming. And what I mean by that is essentially we have many uh, prominent media interveners coming in and saying this gag order e- either needs to be revoked or amended. It's too strict. And actually, um, one of the families of the victims, one of the victims, Kaylee Gonsalves' family, they're also asking, we want this to be amended. It's too strict. Meanwhile, the defense and the prosecution are actually teamed up against the rest of them, basically saying, no, we want this gag order. So you're actually having a strange situation where the defense and the prosecution are sort of in agreement on something and very much trying to keep this gag order in place. And so what I'd like to do with this episode is just kind of take us through all the different points from all of these kind of disparate groups and and talk about what what exactly is going on here. And I think a great way to start would be is if I just kind of read out the gag order right now. The court, by stipulation of the parties, enters its order as follows. It is hereby ordered that the parties to the above titled action, including investigators, law enforcement personnel, attorneys, and agents of the prosecuting attorney or defense attorney, are prohibited from making extrajudicial statements, written or oral, concerning this case, other than a quotation from or reference to, without comment, the public records of the case. This order specifically prohibits any statement which a reasonable person would expect to be disseminated by means of public communication that relates to the following. One, evidence regarding the occurrences or transactions involved in this case. Two, the character, credibility, or criminal record of a party. Three, the performance or results of any examinations or tests or the refusal or failure of a party to submit to such tests or examinations. Four, any opinion as to the merits of the case or the claims or defense of a party. Five, any other matter reasonably likely to interfere with a fair trial of this case, such as, but not limited to, the existence of contents of any confession, admission, or statement given by the defendant, the possibility of a plea of guilt to the charge defense or a lesser offense, or any opinion as to the defendant's guilt or innocence. 
It is further ordered that no person covered by this order shall avoid its prescriptions by actions that indirectly but deliberately cause a violation of this order. It is further ordered that this order and all provisions thereof shall remain in full force and effect throughout these proceedings until such a time as a verdict has been returned unless modified by this court. Megan Marshall, Magistrate Judge. So that was ordered on January 3rd, 2023. So pretty early in the case. So one group that was actually not mentioned in that gag order, at least in writing, was, of course, the victim's family. So you may be wondering, how does Kaylee Gonzalez's family factor into this? Well, according to the Idaho Spokesman Review, basically what they're challenging is the fact that this does apply to their family attorney, uh, Shannon Gray. So based on that, because that attorney is working as their representative and their kind of, you know, spokesperson to a certain degree, they want Gray to be able to speak to this case. And that is the basis for their challenge, as far as I understand this report from the Idaho Spokesman Review. And according to the news station KREM, the order was actually also expanded upon later, and they added attorneys representing the victim's family specifically. So that's made the Gonsalves family feel like, okay, we're not welcome to speak on this because they're gagging our attorney as well. And so that is the basis for why they're speaking out. So then a number of reporters have also made complaints about this. And in court documents, a number of them cite instances of them asking for information and having their requests turned down because of the gag order. Yes. And so what I wanted to do in the the following section is sort of hear from the reporters directly. You're going to be hearing from some of the people that you've probably been following as they cover the case. And you're going to be actually getting a direct sense of the challenges that they have run into due to the gag order, or at least due to public officials citing the gag order. Um, and and I what, what I would love for our audience to take away from this is is the fact that even though a gag order can kind of come down for some good reasons, it still can have a real chilling effect on the media, which is, you know, has consequences of its own, frankly. We'll be going through, we'll be citing specific reporters and their outlets and quoting from some of the complaints they've made around issues they've run into over the gag order. So Kevin will first read from filings from Alex Brizzy and Sally Kritzig of the Idaho Statesman. To provide fair and accurate reporting of information that would be viable to the communities impacted by the murders, I asked the Moscow Police Department about the number of cell phone towers in the area where the murders at the University of Idaho occurred. The Moscow Police Department declined to answer my question, stating that it was bound by a gag order issued in the case. And now the following from Sally Kretzig. I asked the Moscow Police Department about the size of Moscow's jail and the size of Mr. Kohlberger's cell. The Moscow Police Department declined to answer my questions, stating that it was bound by a gag order issued in the case. Next, I'm going to read from a filing from Anjanette Levy of Law and Crime. We've talked to her in the past, um, and we know she's been kind of commended for some of her excellent reporting on the Idaho case. So here are some of the difficulties she's run into. On January 10th, 2023, I contacted Captain Dollinger of the Moscow Police Department in Moscow, Idaho requesting to speak with either him or Police Chief James Fry regarding the general topic of patrolling in the Idaho area and how they were aiming to make students feel safe on campus in the aftermath of the murders. I received a denial, and Captain Dollinger informed me that neither him nor Chief Fry were conducting any further interviews due to the judge's gag order. Next, we'll take the complaints of King TV reporters Chris Ingalls, Erica Zuko, and Taylor Murfindoreski. To provide fair and accurate reporting of information that would be viable to the communities impacted by the murders, I asked Major Christopher Paris of the Pennsylvania State Police whether law enforcement had launched any review of unsolved cases that could be linked to Mr. Kohlberger. Major Paris declined to answer my question, stating that he was bound by a gag order issued in this case. To provide fair and accurate reporting of information that would be valuable to the communities impacted by the murders, I asked Moscow Mayor Art Becky about how the Moscow community was healing. Mayor Becky declined to answer my question, stating that the city attorney advised that he was bound by a gag order issued in the case. 
I submitted public record requests to the Latah County Sheriff's Office and Moscow Police Department. My public record requests were denied because of a gag order issued in this case. Here's Morgan Romero from KTVB. I asked Gary Jenkins, the chief of police at Washington State University, and Matt Young, the communication coordinator for the city of Pullman, whether Mr. Koberger was ever offered a graduate assistant research position with the Pullman Police Department. They both declined to answer my question, stating that they were bound by a gag order issued in this case. So that gives you a sense of the various obstacles that these reporters ran into when coming up against this gag order. Now, you may notice a bit of a trend. A lot of the questions they were asking should not be bound by the gag order. Like saying, what are you going to do to make students feel safer? Or how is the community healing? Those are not gotcha questions about Koberger's case. Or asking for documents. Right. So we can see some trends happening here. You have public officials who, either through a lack of knowledge about what a gag order entails, a overabundant sense of caution spurred on by the gag order, or through you know, kind of using the gag order as an excuse, are basically dodging reasonable questions from members of the media in a way that's frankly not acceptable. Because these are public servants, they should be answering questions from their community. I think the fact that these reporters are not, they're obviously asking questions that are tailored to to deal with the gag order because they're trying to say, okay, well, what, what else can you tell us? So they're, I mean... I, I feel like this is uh, this is definitely highlighting a real problem, and it's one that you and I have run into. In Delphi. In Delphi. It's one that I think a lot of crime reporters run into, where it, 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 a gag order kind of freezes everything. And then it's like, why shouldn't they be commenting about how? How are you going to make these students feel safer? How is the community healing? What is being done that's not specifically about this case, but is relevant to the case? And, you know, the community deserves answers on that. Yeah, and certainly it's very difficult to understand how getting information about how the police are going to try to make people feel safe with perhaps additional patrols. How was information like that going to affect the right of Kohlberger to a fair trial? I don't think that information does affect that at all. It doesn't. Um, and again, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to infer any maliciousness into any parties because i do think you have just a, a community that is frankly reeling and a lot of these public servants they're human beings they're they're affected by this case like everyone else and it's very intimidating to suddenly find yourself at the center of a media storm so i from the perspective of like you know i i worked in public affairs for a summer once so like i know pretty well you can always release a statement later you can't undo releasing a statement that's wrong or problematic so that prompts caution. That prompts fear of doing the wrong thing and messing something up. Basically, it's a chilling effect. Yes. At the same time, though, like, there's got to be a balance, I think. And there's got to be media training about, like, what can you talk about? Or, you know, maybe, like, having a sense of where where's the line? And then what's over the line? But then what's not even close to the line that you can talk about? I think... I think it's it's too easy to use the gag order as an excuse to just not talk about anything. Yeah, and I also want to make the point that the media in this case, they're not saying our right to information trumps Kohlberger's right to a fair trial. They're saying these rights can be better balanced. We can get more information without affecting his right. And also, I think in one of the, one of the media filings, it also raised what I thought was an interesting point which is, well, first of all, publicity in and of itself is not inherently damaging because information can come out that makes a person seem innocent, for instance. But also it's worth remembering that in many cases, I think we've seen this with Delphi and perhaps to a limited extent in Idaho, an absence of information, excessive secrecy can in and of itself affect the climate. Because when people aren't getting information, they're going online and they are speculating and they're inventing theories, conspiracy theories, 
And these can spread and can ultimately get to the point where they affect a person's right to a fair trial. Agreed. It's a situation where we've seen that again and again in Delphi. It's a situation where where responsible reporters, when they're not given access to information or credible sources or documents, they do not report. They will kind of back off because they can't do anything else. They can't just get on the air and say, hey, you know, wouldn't it be crazy if it was really a cover up? No, they're not going to do that. They're going to they're going to basically go away from the story. And who swoops in? Well, it's people who are not being very responsible, who just want to speculate. And I think you and I, in certain contexts, speculation is fine. And as long as you're like labeling it as such and kind of being upfront about that, no problem, more power to you. But when that's all people are getting, that's not a very good, that's not a very good situation because it's not balanced out with real facts. And yeah, I mean, so I'm going to take a moment to read the kind of very interesting filing from this group of media entities. And before I do so, I'm going to rattle off the media entities involved because we always like get to give credit whenever people are doing the hard work of actually getting documents out there and getting more information out there. The attorneys for the media interveners in this case were representing the Associated Press, the Radio Television Digital News Association, Sinclair Media, KBOI TV, the Idaho Capital Sun, KREM, KTVB, EastIdahoNews.com, the Lewiston Tribune, Washington State Association of Broadcasters, the Idaho Press Club, Idaho Education News, KXLY TV, 4 News Now, KAPP slash KVEW TV, Morgan Murphy Media, KXLY, Scripps Media, KIVI TV, The Spokesman Review, The New York Times Company, Law News Inc., ABC, The Washington Post, the Society of Professional Journalists, the McClatchy Company, and the Seattle Times. So those groups were represented by attorneys Wendy Olson and Corey Carone. First, interveners respect Mr. Koberger's right to a fair trial, and they do not contend that their First Amendment rights are the only constitutional rights at issue here. Interveners stand by their prior assertions that when defining the bounds of the First Amendment, an orderly society must also consider a criminal defendant's right to a fair trial and that the court's task when considering a gag order is to ensure a proper balance between the First and Sixth Amendments. Intervenor's argument is that those rights were improperly balanced when a gag order initially was entered, and when it was amended in this case. The First Amendment, of course, is the right to free speech, and the Sixth Amendment, of course, covers a defendant's right to a fair trial. So both very important and both that it, rights that can sometimes feel at odds in a situation like this. Interveners agree that their First Amendment rights yield to Mr. Koberger's Sixth Amendment rights, but only when Mr. Koberger's Sixth Amendment rights will actually be infringed by intervener speech. Strict scrutiny analysis teases out where that line lies, and the amended non-dissemination order dated January 18th, 2023, fails under that test. Interveners agree that there has been and will continue to be great publicity surrounding this case, but publicity alone is not prejudicial. Any statement concerning this case is not prejudicial. Statements can be exculpatory, inculpatory, or irrelevant. The state's and Mr. Koberger's failure to present any evidence of prejudicial news coverage and the court's failure to consider alternative measures means the competing constitutional rights here were improperly balanced and the gag order should be vacated. If anything, the gag order prejudices Mr. Koberger by depriving the public of quality information, creating a vacuum for rampant speculation online. So that is essentially the crux of the argument, in addition to the fact that this has had a chilling effect and that case law is on their side. And let me just pause for a second. They use the term strict scrutiny in there. Strict scrutiny is uh, a legal term. It basically means if the government has a compelling interest they wish to serve with a ruling or what have you, it must be very narrowly tailored. So it protects that interest and doesn't infringe on other interests. And basically what they're saying here is not that we should be able to do whatever we want under the First Amendment. It's just that, yes, his Sixth Amendment rights are very important but it needs to be balanced with our First Amendment rights. That's basically what they're saying. But of course, there's another side to this, and that is the defense and the prosecution strongly disagree. 
the defense actually made what you described as a pretty salty filing. It's a salty filing. And it's also, in my view, over the top in terms of its rhetoric. I think it's a bit, what's the word, exuberant? I don't know. It, it, it's, it's a little bit much is what I'm saying. Why don't you read us some of it? Yes, I, with, with pleasure. And to be clear, this is an objection to media's motion to vacate the amended non-dissemination order. And it is from one of Koberger's attorneys named J. Weston Logsdon. It's a long filing, so I'm not going to read the entire thing. I will be reading a few excerpts from this document. Comes now Brian C. Koberger by and through their attorney, J. Weston Logsdon, chief deputy litigation, and hereby objects to the motion to vacate the amended non-dissemination order on the grounds that justification exists to support the continued existence of the amended non-dissemination order. And even if this court finds it is overbroad, it remains appropriate to have an order reminding lawyers and their agents of the rules of engagement in this country and that we try cases in court, not in the press. So, okay. I mean, that's kind of the opening thesis. Not too salty yet. Here's where we get a bit more, get more intense. While ruling on the standing issue, the court found that a vague, overbroad, unduly restrictive, or not narrowly drawn non-dissemination order would be unconstitutional. The court then found that the order states that it includes but is not limited to attorneys and their agents, possibly applying to a broad swath of the population. The court then found that the memorandum of the January 13, 2023 meeting shows that the order does not apply to witnesses. All the same, the court held that the media's concerns about the order were not merely contrived. Armed with this language, the media returned to this court on May 1st, 2023, seemingly triumphant, proclaiming that the Supreme Court agreed that unconstitutional orders are unconstitutional and that all is left is for this court to follow its lead. However, things are never so simple. On May 16th, 2023, the state's superseding indictment came down. As if specifically to epitomize the concerns of Mr. Koberger, the state and this court, NBC's Dateline released another special on this case on May 19th, 2023. Using the same playbook the media has chosen throughout this case, the special gets details of the investigation wrong, despite access to the arrest affidavit. It chooses to treat Mr. Koberger as already guilty, asking multiple experts to speculate as to how and why he committed the murders without once asking if the police have the right person. And it provides audiences with made-up evidence of Mr. Koberger's character that will never see the inside of a courtroom. It even had a leak just a little over two weeks after the media claimed there were none. The upshot of this, and similar media stories, is a constant feedback loop of people crying out for Mr. Koberger's blood. One of those that now leads that pack happens to be a lawyer who has inserted himself into this case. Mr. Gray, who despite the order not to communicate with the media, can be seen doing just that over and over again ever since the indictment occurred. Most recently, on June 2, 2023, the media filed an additional memorandum in support of its motion, as well as eight declarations of various reporters previously contained in counsel for the media's own declaration, apparently to illustrate the dangers of hearsay. According to the media's new memorandum, this court should not accept an ambush of evidence from the actual parties in the case because we had our chance back when we both agreed the non-dissemination order was necessary. Into this maelstrom, Mr. Koberger once again objects to the media's demands and asks this court to uphold the rule of law, included, but not limited to, his constitutional rights to being presumed innocent and to fair trial. Okay, so wow. First of all, dang, is that some call of her language, like maelstrom, and they're out for blood. As a journalist, I, I think I have a probably a somewhat biased opinion on some of this, but I also think he raises some interesting points. What did you find interesting? I'm curious. I, I think it's interesting that he's basically saying, okay, that basically the, the news media is terrible and gets facts wrong regardless. I, I would tend to say that when the media is sort of unable to speak with expert opinions and, and, and you know, people who would be close to the case and be able to speak on it, at least in terms of just defining the, the bare facts, you know, that can create a situation where errors do happen. I, I don't know what specific errors he's talking about in the NBC special. I, I, I was somewhat surprised because what we've read from the media's filing talked about things. There should be strict scrutiny. There should be a careful balancing of interests. And this filing was basically, oh, the media is bad. 
Some of them have made mistakes, so it's not worth talking to any of them at all. Yeah, basically didn't, throw them all out. It didn't really seem to engage with what the media interveners were actually saying. So while it might be entertaining reading, I'm not sure it's really... It's very entertaining reading. It's almost written like an over-the-top news story with yeah, some of the oddly, language. Ironically enough, it seems to be written... For the media. Yeah. Kind of like to, you know, kind of screw you guys. Uh or so kind I, of, I, kind of to like, kind of brush them off, or say, you know, we, we. I mean, it's like this. It's like if it, it feels like this. It feels like, I mean, to use a stupid analogy, like if you and I had a quarrel, and you came up to me and said, Anya, you really hurt my feelings when you did this specific thing. Can we talk about that? And and my response is like, well, Kevin, I just think you suck. Like, <laughs> like it's like it's not engaging with it. It's just sort of um, kind of a uh, mean spirited. And also, I think it's absolutely utterly preposterous to accuse a group as diverse, varied, and all over the place as, quote unquote, the media of being, of wanting to being after Koberger's blood. There's something that's just so ludicrously over the top about that. It's almost like, wow. Because, I mean, you and I criticize the media all the time. We're part of the media uh, we're, we're part of, you know, we have a new media outlet. We try to kind of, you know, be journalistic in our approach to different cases. But there's a lot of criticisms to be had about media. But it's such a broad category that it, it helps to be careful about how you approach some of those criticisms instead of just kind of like, everybody wants to kill him. That's why they're reporting on this. What? See, yeah, I didn't. It may be entertaining. Really. It didn't really feel like a serious fight. Oh, it's it doesn't. I mean. It's 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 supposed to I think it's more of like a, a, a salvo, you know, yeah. it's like a it's a shot over the media's bow. It's not I think kind of when you have to resort to that, it's telling. Um, I mean, I will note that he does go into a lot of the cases discussed here in, in kind of continuing, um, you know, a, a kind of acidic tone, you know, saying the media having mangled Supreme Court precedent makes one last attempt to save their argument. It almost feels like it was written by like some sort of wild 1920s newspaper reporter in some terms of some of like the, the slang like kind of like the the diction is just kind of very over the top in a way that's fascinating to me but but i want to i do want to include just because i think it's like wow then this court can consider the nature of the publicity the media coverage of this case has been uniformly abysmal even ignoring the true crime community on social media, professional media such as NBC Dateline, News Nation, and Fox News have been a never-ending circus of bad facts and worse opinions, all intended to see Mr. Koberger killed. To be sure, none of these organizations knows Mr. Koberger, and some will occasionally remind viewers he has not been convicted yet, but none put any substantive information about the case, preferring instead to tantalize viewers with gory theories and whatever nightmares the parade of experts can create. Even after this court admonished the media at the previous hearing in this case to recall it has a duty to truth and upholding our Sixth Amendment, only a handful thought it worth reporting. So, yeah, he's actually saying that a, a group of news outlets want Koberger to die. That seems really over the top. He also really goes after the Gonsalves family lawyer, Shannon Gray. So very personal, very pissed off, over the top, but interesting. The prosecutor also weighed in with a far more toned down filing, and that came in on June 6, 2023. Balancing First and Sixth Amendment interests in this case, the amended non-dissemination order is not vague, overbroad, or unduly restrictive as it limits only the speech of the prosecuting attorney, defense attorney, and any attorney representing a witness, victim, or victim's family as well as the parties in the above entitled action, including but not limited to investigators, law enforcement personnel, and agents for the prosecuting attorney or defense attorney. These parties have special insights and information in the case, and limiting their speech to only those documents which are part of the official public record of the case provides a fair balance of First and Sixth Amendment rights. Even if strict scrutiny applies, the order addresses the serious and imminent threat that unrestricted extrajudicial statements pose in a case surrounded by intense publicity, is narrowly drawn to trial participants, attorneys involved in the case, and is the least restrictive alternative. So we're get, definitely getting a, a more 
kind of legal focused and less um, over the top, you know, argument from the prosecutor there. But I think it is no- interesting to note that the prosecution and the defense attorneys are together on this. They're they're on the same side. Yeah. What do you make of that? For people who might be surprised by that. I, I think it shows that both of them recognize that excessive publicity could truly be harmful to a fair trial and that both of them want to see limits. I think we've, we've seen a variety of reports about what's happening in that community. A lot of reporters have come in, a lot of TikTokers, YouTubers, and the like. And maybe the people who see it firsthand are just uh, concerned. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, a, that's something that we very much understand. Now, there has been a development in the gag order before we get started on our Delphi conversation. Basically, what's happened in, in late June was that the gag order was upheld, but it was loosened. Judge John C. Judge, that's his last name, and it also his title, ironically, he said that it was overly broad and, and narrowed it considerably. So what does that exactly mean? Well, now the various people bound by the gag order are allowed to talk about procedural issues and answer questions around that sort of thing, but they still don't want anybody talking about like guilt or innocence. And Shannon Gray is still not exempted from the order. So he is very much uh, a part of that. The Associated Press's request that the amended non-dissemination order be vacated is denied. However, the revised amended non-dissemination order will replace the amended non-dissemination order and will clarify and narrow the restrictions on speech and the individuals whose speech is restrained. So that was on June 23rd, 2023. And I will read through the kind of new clarified language to give you a sense of what has changed. As currently drafted, the amended non-dissemination order is arguably overbroad and vague in some areas. However, it does serve a legitimate purpose, and restricting the speech of attorneys participating in the case is reasonable. The very limited incidental effects of the speech restrictions on the media's First Amendment rights are overridden by the compelling interest in ensuring a fair trial by an impartial jury. Statements by counsel participating in the case on matters bearing on the merits of the case might impair the fairness of the trial or threaten the integrity of the judicial process. The amended non-dissemination order is not intended to conceal the workings of the criminal justice system from the public. The media is not restrained in any way and is free to attend hearings and report on what they observe and hear. For these reasons, media's request that the amended non-dissemination order be vacated is denied. However, because the amended non-dissemination order is arguably overbroad and vague, the court will issue a revised amended non-dissemination order to further clarify it. And here is the ensuing revised amended non-dissemination order. Therefore, the following is ordered. One, the prosecuting attorneys, defense attorneys, and any agents of the prosecuting attorneys and defense attorneys, and any attorneys representing witnesses, victims, or a victim's family are prohibited from making extrajudicial statements, written or oral, that the lawyer or agent knows or reasonably should know will have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing or otherwise influencing the outcome of the case. This order specifically prohibits any out-of-court statement which a reasonable person would expect to be disseminated by means of public communication that relates to the following. A. The identity or nature of evidence expected to be presented at trial or any sentencing phase of the proceedings. B. Any information a lawyer knows or reasonably should know is likely to be inadmissible as evidence in a trial and that would, if disclosed, create a substantial risk of prejudicing an impartial trial. C. The character, credibility, reputation, or criminal record of a party, victim, or witness. D. The identity of a witness. E, the expected testimony of a party, victim, or witness. F, the performance or results of any examination or test or the refusal or failure of the defendant or a witness to submit to an examination or test. G, any opinion as to the guilt or innocence of the defendant. H, the possibility of a plea of guilty to the offenses or any comment on any plea discussions. I, the existence of or contents of any confession, admission, or statement by the defendant or the refusal of the defendant to make any statement. J. Any information obtained by witnesses, the victim's families, or their attorneys from the state that is confidential and has not been publicly disclosed by the prosecuting attorneys. 2. 
Attorneys involved in the case and their agents, as outlined in paragraph one, may make extrajudicial statements, written or oral, concerning the following. A. The claim, offense, or defense involved and, except when prohibited by law, the identity of the parties involved. B. Information contained in the public record. C. That an investigation is ongoing. D. The scheduling or result of any step in the litigation. E. A request for assistance from the public in obtaining evidence and information necessary to the state's case or the defense's case. F. A warning of danger concerning the behavior of a person involved when there is reason to believe that there exists the likelihood of substantial harm to an individual or to the public interest. G. The identity, residence, occupation, and family status of the accused. H. The fact time and place of arrest. I. The identity of investigating and arresting officers or agencies and the length of the investigation. And J. A statement that a reasonable lawyer would believe is required to protect a client from the substantial undue prejudicial effect of recent publicity not initiated by the lawyer or the lawyer's client. Any such statement shall be limited to such information as is necessary to mitigate the recent adverse publicity. Three, no individual covered by this revised amended non-dissemination order shall deliberately avoid its prescription by actions in directly or indirectly that result in violating this order. Four, this revised amended non-dissemination order shall remain in full force and effect until the conclusion of a trial and any sentencing proceedings that may follow unless otherwise ordered by this court. So that's Judge Judge coming in, basically saying we're switching things around. Here's what you can talk about. Here's what you cannot talk about. There's a lot of stuff that's frankly not in there, you know, like a lot of the questions the media was asking wasn't even covered in either one of those groups because they were so unrelated to the case against Koberger. So one would hope that in the spirit of actually adhering to the gag order, some public officials will at least be a little bit more amenable to answering some of those questions. That would be nice. But I doubt it. (laughs) And I doubt that because I, I, I it's not because I think they're bad or doing something wrong. I think. I think when you're in a situation where you're you're a leader in a community that's gone through something so horrible, there's a tendency to be like really paranoid about like saying stuff that could hurt the case. And do you want that to come back to you? Do you want to be the one who the victim's families look at at the end of the day as the person who botched the case? No. So, and you know, it's basically like, hassle to deal with reporters sometimes so i think there's also that that is true (laughs) we're really annoying (laughs) you know and speaking of of us being annoying why don't we move on to the delphi case oh there you go so in delphi the gag order came down uh back in december december 2nd 2022 And it happened just after the defense issued a multi-page statement outlining their perspective on the case. Yeah. And that then Sheriff of Carroll County Tobe Lesenby responded to. Yes. Or at least I don't know if it was Lesenby in particular, but it was definitely the Carroll County Sheriff's Office. So there was a bit of a back and forth outside of the courtroom. Yeah. So let's read the uh, order that uh, Judge Gold uh, signed that day. On the court's motion, in response to defendant's undated press release, the court issues an order granting the state's motion for order prohibiting the parties, counsel, law enforcement officials, court personnel, coroner, and family members from disseminating information or releasing any extrajudicial statements by means of public communication in whole, Pending hearing, which the court has just recently scheduled for January 13th, 2023 at 10 a.m. in the Carroll Circuit Court. Counsel for the state of Indiana and the defendant, as well as their professional staff and other personnel, law enforcement officials, court personnel, coroner, and all family members are prohibited from commenting on this case to the public and to the media, directly or indirectly, by themselves or through any intermediary in any form, including any social media platforms. Counsel are reminded that they are required to conform to the Indiana Rules of Court, Rules of Professional Conduct, specifically Rule 3.6, Trial Publicity in its Entirety, and Rule 3.8, Special Responsibilities of a Prosecutor in its Entirety. Violations of this order are punishable as contempt of court 
and subject the violator to a fine and or incarceration. Kind of a brutal line there at the end, <laughs> saying that if you violate this order, you can be incarcerated. Yes. So this is an order from Judge Fran Gull from December, of course. And in Delphi, it feels like there's not really as much of a fight from the media with stuff like this. It's people, people I think, I feel like collectively, as people in the media covering this case, there's more of a sense of like, well, yeah, that's just how it is. You know, like there's like not like a, we need this information. There's a lot more of a, well, this is how it's been from the beginning. So. Yeah. And that frankly is a little bit surprising to me. A, a number of people have asked us, you know, of course, we were the ones that filed a motion into the case saying, hey, these documents should be released. They haven't been released. You really ought to release them. And they ended up getting released. And a number of people said, you know, we're surprised that other media organizations didn't join you in that. And I think it's fair to say we were surprised, too. We did offer the opportunity. Yes. Then again, in fairness to them, it is expensive to hire attorneys. And so if someone's telling you that they're going to do it anyway, maybe you just kind of are like, well, I don't need to gild the lily there. <laughs> but also keep in mind that by the time we filed for those documents, the situation had been ongoing for months. That is true. So it does seem to be a different climate in Indiana than in There's Idaho. There's so much baked in secrecy, though, here because of the investigative, like everything can be denied to the media because it's quote unquote under investigation. And in some cases, that's completely legitimate and makes sense. And in other cases, it's like a cold case that hasn't been properly investigated in years. So it's like, what are we doing here? But it gives a lot of leeway to prosecutors and law enforcement in a way that is kind of unilaterally tilted towards their side of things. And there's very little recourse for the media. So I think we're, we're all kind of just beaten down here. You know, it's like we're kind of not expecting much. We take the gag order with much more gentle good humor. And perhaps we should. It is a very broad gag order, in my opinion. Yes. I found it somewhat troubling that it included the family members of the victims, because I feel like they've done a great job with advocating for their loved ones. And it kind of felt a little bit like, why are we not letting them talk? At the same time... I don't know that this is how they feel. I'm speculating completely. Given the amount of media scrutiny and the amount of nonsense that they've been through over the years, I could also see them being relieved. Or, like, I think I would be relieved to, like, not have to talk to people anymore because it's, like, that's a lot. That's a lot to ask of them. I have an issue with it, but if they don't, then it might be a good for them. I mean, they might view it as a good thing because it's, like, people aren't going to be hounding them as much for, hey, tell us what your thoughts are on this. Because that's a hard thing to talk about, obviously. There's There was the motion to challenge the gag order in Idaho. There was no such motion in Indiana. I don't even know how we'd go about filing that. I don't think you and I have any plans to file such a motion because I, I don't even. At this particular point in time, we have no such plan. That's correct. So we're not hinting at anything here is what I'm trying to say. I'm just uh, – it, it's just – um Noting the differences between the two states and the two approaches in the media to both cases. But this essentially means that all the talking in Delphi has to be done through court. You know, there's not going to be other press conferences un until we get to trial. I mean, I guess there's a possibility that at some point the gag order will be loosened or narrowed, but we're not aware of any such happenings at this time right how do you think the gag order has affected coverage of this case i, I don't know how do, how do you think it has i don't think it's affected it that much i think there's been a lot of secrecy since day one i think given the role that the bullet will likely play at trial i can understand some of that more now i think it has had the unfortunate effect of um empowering people to just go online and just say whatever and that's not been super helpful but I think generally the kind of like it's the the secrecy in the case predates the gag order. So I'm not going to act like the gag order changes a lot, frankly. I think the gag order just, you know, kind of makes it more official. I want to kind of go away from Indiana and Idaho now and get into more of a general discussion of gag orders. OK, because they do come up in criminal cases. If you're listening to the show, you probably are interested in crime and true crime and, and whatnot. And Kevin, you and I have had the weird experience of of having interacted with so many people who have no idea what gag orders are and how they work. 
And I, I sometimes to, to, to cite a silly meme, it's like that commercial where the woman's like, that's not how any of this works. I feel like that was us for a while when the CAG order first came down because we got a lot of the following. People would say, how is the murder sheet even reporting on this anymore? There's a gag order, don't you know? And can you explain why that statement doesn't make any sense? Read the text of the gag order, number one. There's nothing in there about the media. And number two, there couldn't be anything in there about the media because the media has a First Amendment right to cover how the government operates and functions. I'm Yeah, what I'm trying to do is get beyond Delphi. I'm just trying – everybody should know – that gag orders, as a rule, never apply to the media. The media can do what it wants. It's basically applying to the media's sources. The media's sources, who could be the prosecutor, the defense attorney, the the police officer who investigated the case, they are not allowed to speak to the media. The media can still continue its reporting. When the media is barred from reporting on a topic, legally speaking, that is called prior restraint. And that is incredibly rare. That is a very, very rare instance. And it is often frowned upon because it's very violating to First Amendment rights, which, of course, are very important rights, rights to free speech, rights to free press. It's, you know, pretty well enshrined in our legal system. So those are very rare cases where basically you're coming in and saying, like, let's say a newspaper gets a story about something a confidential police source did and the police get wind of it. They file prior restraint with a judge saying, you you know, you can't report this. It's usually temporary. First of all, it often doesn't stick, but that would be like an instance where you could say the media was gagged. Very rare has never happened to us. I don't know anyone who's ever happened to. And also by the text of the gag orders, they apply only to extra judicial statements so that means anything that is said in court can be covered and covered widely so reporters can still go to court they can still listen and write and cover what happens in court they can keep an eye on court filings because in cases like this a tremendous amount of what ultimately happens in trial is at the very least previewed in these court filings you can report on that but if you ever see people talking on the internet and you know flashing around their reddit school of law badges and saying you know these people are reporting on it even though there's a gag order please roll your eyes for me because that's just not how it works and that's that's not a real thing so before we concluded i wanted to kind of take a moment kind of give you a sense of where we stand as reporters and and just also kind of give you a sense of what the different arguments are before we conclude so you can draw your own conclusions about gag orders, their usefulness, their drawbacks. So we'll start with the pros. One easy way to impeach yourself as a witness is to go out and do a lot of media interviews where you say different things, right? Yes. Or to uh, go out and, you know, get money from an outlet that wants to interview you. Even if you're telling the truth, a story can change slightly in details, as you tell it over and over again. People make mistakes. They may kind of fill in the blanks in an attempt to answer a question. It doesn't mean they're liars. It just means that you can misspeak. There can be issues with... So if you give a lot of interviews and you go into court, uh, somebody says, oh, this doesn't really fit with what you told uh, this TV channel two years ago. Oh, that doesn't fit what you told this other uh, radio station one year ago. That's not always going to be a big deal because I think some juries might recognize, well, you know, it's it, that doesn't mean they lied. Maybe they misspoke in one interview or another. But if it's a, it can be a problem and it can be a bad look for a jury. And in addition to that, it, you know, if if it's something more egregious, like a tabloid paid you, you know, five thousand dollars for your story, then you know, or you monetize your story in some way, then basically the defense can say, okay, well, maybe you have an incentive to tell this story. And, and that's impeaching. In addition to that, you know, I mean, like even just criticizing law enforcement or saying law enforcement did a terrible job in this case, like that can be then replayed in court and be like, you know, an issue. I would say a big thing, though, with the pros of gag orders are that they do help protect a defendant's right to a fair trial. A lot of times you'll see prosecutors supporting gag orders because 
it would look kind of suspect if they didn't, I think, because they want to – believe it or not, the prosecutor often wants to protect the pro- the defendant's right to a fair trial because otherwise the case could get overturned later. That's actually something that happened in a case that we covered. If you look back at our episodes on the other Long Island serial killer, Francis Blouth, this was a man who brutally killed three restaurant workers around Long Island in 1959 – And there was so much pretrial publicity around that case in Long Island that his initial conviction got overturned and they had to do another trial because um, it was it was, you know, basically found to have violated his rights. And that prevented him from getting executed. And he eventually got out of prison, which I think is ridiculous because he was a pretty brutal serial killer. But that's just my own opinion. Whatever. I'm just saying that that can have an impact. So. From the prosecution standpoint, ensuring that things go by the book and correctly the first time is a key part of the job. And the defense, they want their they want their client to have a fair trial. They want their client to not be, you know, splashed all over every media outlet in the world and having people, you know, associate them with this horrible crime. Because a lot of people instinctively are like, well, it sounds like he did it. It can be hard to keep an open mind when the coverage is so much like... Look at this creepy dude. With all that said, let's look at the other side of the ledger. Let's look at the arguments against gag orders. It's undeniable when you limit a person's right to speak, you know, to our government officials, that's basically stifling First Amendment freedoms. And it's also therefore making it more difficult for the press to accurately cover the functions of the government, which is a very important role of the press. Because, you know, when you limit the ability of reputable people to speak to the press about their work, that creates a pretty substantial limitation on what the press is able to accurately report. And then that has the side effect, because if people are clamoring for information about Delphi or about Idaho, and journalists can't get information from reputable people, then other people will step in and spread rumors and gossip, which cause confusion and can lead to problems of their own. Uh, Another really strong argument against gag rules is that they cause confusion. People who work in government may may not fully realize what, what falls under the limits of the gag order and what doesn't. And so because of that, there's a chilling effect and they hold back more information than they are supposed to. And that's a pretty big problem. Or they hide behind a gag order because they don't want to have to deal with reporters or answer questions. And all of that is bad because it means that the communities that these people serve are not getting the information and coverage they're entitled to. It sounds like that the a good balance in this situation or in any situation would be a narrowly specifically tailored gag order that is not overly broad and is you know, basically encouraging public officials to answer every other question except maybe in these several topics and for public officials to receive media training so that they can know what is appropriate and then what is not appropriate to speak about prior to a big trial. I think that sounds like a a great uh, approach. We solved all the problems, folks. (laughs) Well, listen, thanks so much for listening to our talk on gag orders and let us know if you have any questions. In the meantime, we'll continue to cover these cases and other different legal issues that we find of interest and stay tuned. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, 
you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.